One of the areas where people talk about deploying virtualization early on is mobile edge compute to support that getting the, the, the packets off of the, the radio and onto the fiber as soon as possible. What is your view of mobile edge compute and how soon is it going to become real? I think uh, the way we're heading this is centralized baseband units as opposed to distributed. I mean, uh, small cells drive you there immediately because you can't put a baseband unit into every radio that you're trying to hang on, on spans or poles or buildings. So that's what drove us there. Then we're saying, well, you know, we can use our existing hub locations or we can pull that back into a hotel or a central office if it's in footprint or other things that we've got resources available and pull those baseband units together at that point. It also provides a, uh, a common point to do caching and other things that you would normally, that you couldn't distribute out any further. If you create these, these centralized baseband units, A, you take advantage of LTE Advanced and what 5G is promising to be and other things, but it allows you to get there in a step function so that you don't have to wait for all of that new 5G stuff to become available before you actually put this in place. You're going to want to have it there ahead of time so that you can leverage it when it becomes reality. Another place that people are looking at deploying NFV is at the edge of the network for virtual CPE. Is that something that's on your radar? Yeah, it is uh, because again it's it's that service velocity. You know, how can you do it a little quicker because you're not running out there and putting a different uh, demarcation device or, or NID for every single customer and or customer service. And so it, it has a lot of merit. Now granted we got to work out a lot of bugs before we get there, but it does have a lot of merit. One of the things that is interesting about that application that goes back to what you were saying before is that it's not necessary to virtualize everything at the edge. And one, one application that we've seen is that and also you don't want to virtualize everything centrally because of certain functions such as routing or security or caching may need to be at the edge. So we've seen applications for creating a service chain starting at the customer edge with some of those key functions mm -hmm. while other functions perhaps like the VPN or uh, security could reside uh, more centrally. So is that consistent with what uh, you're, you're thinking about? It is. Um and again, uh, we have to work a lot of these things out. We're trying a lot of it now. We're doing trials of everything you can imagine uh, to try and come to the right answer, to get the best architecture, because there is a balancing act. Of course, the more things you centralize, uh, the easier they are to manage, the lower OPEX, the, the better you can uh, upgrade them when you do it. You've got fewer boxes in the field, but it doesn't work for everything. And, and trying to balance that, I think, is what we're trying to do different than some others, rather than just saying it must be virtualized. Everything has to go into the cloud, and we know that that's not necessarily the case. One of your colleagues shared with me uh, some interesting thoughts on how the, the PE routers are built and he said his problem was that they were deploying the PE routers, the same PE router in both the public and private internet parts of Verizon and in the public internet side it tended to be all fixed routes, static routes and so you would run out of bandwidth while you had all this compute or the, the, mm -hmm. uh, forwarding. Yeah, the forwarding, you, run, you, have plenty, you filled up the forwarding but you have control plane capacity left. And then if you looked at the private IP side, you would run out of VRF instances while you still had plenty of capacity left. And he said what we really need is to have a very efficient forwarding machine, basically the hardware part of a router, but decoupled from the control plane so I can size those independently based on whether it's a forwarding heavy application or a compute heavy application. Does that match what you're exactly what we're talking about there exactly what we're talking about and that uh, that again seems to make perfect sense because we know we can get that hardware today we know we can pull that off uh, this is no different than we did back in the switching world 30 years ago with an adjunct processor you know we moved when we went from you know inline signaling to SS7 we moved that off to a different computer yeah. and we were able to process calls a whole lot faster and drive the the switch you know the the digital switch this is very much the same process I think we understand it I think we're working with our suppliers, again, traditional suppliers here, to allow us to do that, to help us do that. And, and that's where that relationship comes up again. We need their help in order to accomplish that. Um, they need it in order so that we keep buying that hardware. So I think it's a, I think it's a, a business case that can work out, or a business relationship that does work out. Another aspect, uh, another variant of the commercial aspect is open source. And some suppliers are concerned that open source is just a way for operators to get free code. But an uh, industry spokesman that I heard put a very eloquent case forward for everybody embracing it, and that is we've been doing the same old thing for years and years. For example, performance monitoring, uh, alarm collection and, and generation. Mm -hmm. Why should we keep doing the same old thing over and over? If we can find an open source implementation, 
invitation and embrace it, then we can focus on the more interesting and lucrative aspects of actually generating services. What is your view on that and do you see Verizon making contributions to open source in any way? Yes, we're already a part of ONLAB and others and uh, we, we are anxious to do those. We are looking for the use cases that make sense. Again, trying to find the ones that, that are um, low-hanging fruit, something that we can take advantage of today rather than waiting for a long period of time, but also not trying to do everything in an open source code because again, we're still working with the same suppliers in many cases. And uh, you know, open source has its limitations. There, there's, there's things that have to be built over and above that in order to make it applicable to a lot of the hardware that's out there today or that even we're getting now. So I think we're taking the, the uh, approach that we want to do it where it makes sense and where we can actually accomplish something as opposed to trying to just blanket statement, uh, everything should be open source because we know we have to work with our, our partners. We want to partner with them to bring the, the functionality that we want to bear. Uh, the other alternative is Let's wait for everything and not get anything done in the next five years. You know, do that's a, that's the challenge. Answer everything before we do anything. That's yes, exactly. not a way to get started. What are some areas that make sense for open source? Have you identified those? Certainly, the uh, anything that is is a uh, appliance or not directly related to the hardware itself makes perfect sense. Um, as you said, some of the things that we can offboard um, centralized uh, routing is one of the things that that seems to make sense, a path computational element right. or an engine. That seems to make a lot of sense because you can do it multi-layer, multi-vendor, multi-domain, day one, and you can do that offline and you can do that with uh, different kinds of software. It, doesn't, it actually doesn't pertain to any one of the individual um, equipment suppliers, or could or could not. Right. You could use any one you wanted. And you can make much smarter decisions in a centralized fashion looking at mul all three layers and all vendors involved in an end-to-end -end service provisioning. That seems to make a whole lot of sense. That's one of the ones we're doing first. We're going to drive that into the network, but then we're going to leverage all of those domain controllers for transport, if you will, and or routing off-shelf uh, centralized route reflectors and things of this nature in order to implement it, rather than saying we have to go to every single network element to do that. Uh, so it's a combination of the two where that's one function we know we can pull off and you know centralize it. It makes a whole lot of sense. You can get a more optimized network design, but then you still need to rely on the existing infrastructure and you need to be able to provision that with the tools that you have available today. Are the people within Verizon getting it? That Are they seeing that they need to make a, this, this transition into more centralized control, more distribution of functions where they need to go in the network? new methods of development, are they, is that all being embraced? Yes, being embraced uh, very, very much so. And a lot of that centralization is, again, taking something like a path computational engine, but not necessarily network protection or the control plane related to signaling or something of that nature. You gotta leave that in the network where it belongs, MPLS fast rerouting, right. good example. You're not gonna pull that out and centralize it because you put it there so it'd be fast. Um, but figuring out where those routes should be and optimizing those, those route designs to begin with, perfect function to be centralized. Now you, by doing that, you're introducing an interesting problem in that in the past, there was a one-on-one -on -one correlation between the network elements, the control plane, and the services. Now through either centralization of control or virtualization, you have a degree of separation between either the, where the software is, well, between where the software is running and where the services are. So that while creating benefits in terms of creating the service and lowering costs and making it more efficient, could perhaps complicate troubleshooting. How are you tackling that? Yeah, the network, we still want to view the network as the database of record because that's what the folks looking at from the Knox Center see. That's what they're working on. They're not working on that great design that you've got in the centralized cloud. They're working on reality. I've got a fiber failure here or a card outage there or a node failure here and I need to resolve that. Where's the traffic today? What is the, the network? This is our first thing that we're trying to pull in. You know, when you said prioritization of that, network uh, inventory and connectivity is the first one we're going after. That's the, what we feel, at least from a transport route perspective, was the must have. If your inventory system isn't accurate and it isn't up to date and it isn't looking at the network itself, then there's no way to make those decisions. Um, we can do optimization all day long, but if we don't know exactly how it's configured today, then we're gonna get the wrong answer. And uh, tying those two together won't be easy, but we're seeing that inventory, that retrieving of data, and minimizing that as our first step. Uh, we're using, again, we're using third-party suppliers, so don't in this case, to 
to accomplish that for us because it's something that you can't go and ask a domain controller for because it only knows about its domain. You need something that looks multi-layer, multi-vendor, multi-domain in order to figure it out. I was talking to another service provider who had a very similar view, but instead of saying it was really being driven by inventory, he said everything is driven off of topology. If you, if you understand topology, and they're, they're, they're closely related. They're closely related in, in that uh, one aspect. I would say we can go to the router and look at the virtual, you know, or the, not the virtual, but the, the topology. We can go to the transport world, we can get the topology. Tying the two together has always been a trick. <laughs> you know, do we have the right port going to the right port? Right, right. And this is st this is the one that we're tackling first because we believe it's imperative. It's got to be there in order to do the optimization. Yeah, and that's what he was talking about was the multi-layer topology. Yeah, but now we're we're adding yet another layer. So we've got the, the the networking physical layer, and then there's the protocol layer, the routing or whatever, and then there's potentially a virtualization layer for services running on top of that. So it, it gets a it's, lot more squishy. And it's going to be a complex problem, but uh, it's one that I believe is achievable. I mean, it's not like we're trying to change physics. It's not like we have to wait five years for new hardware to be developed. We're, we're putting network elements out today, even in the transport world, that have a fabric in them. They've got a switching capability. You know, before when they were static, didn't really matter. It meant it was going to take me days to send somebody out to move patch cords around, uh, if not longer, and he might make mistakes, and things are going to get, that messes up that inventory even worse. Right. Now with an electrical fabric and a photonic fabric, I know exactly what's connected to what, and I can manipulate it. This is a huge difference that, um, that without it, all of the SDN stuff we're doing for a transport world anyway wouldn't even matter. There was nothing to change. A MUX bonder had a port on it and it had a patch cord and it went somewhere else and that was a static connection. The wavelength was a static connection. You know, the rotoms uh, were a degree, a port, a wavelength, hard fixed, hard coded, nothing you could really move, at least not automatically. Um, that's all changing with current generation equipment. Well, Glenn, you've talked a lot about some very sophisticated work going on in your network, but many operators are concerned about the over-the-top guys. How can you leverage the investments that you're making, your sophisticated control and, and management, to provide services that have value to your customers beyond what the OTT guys can bring? Well, I think the, the biggest one is connectivity to the customer, right, and, and reliable connectivity. That's something that we can do that they cannot, and uh, it's something that hopefully they'll see value in and, and uh, and have to pay us for that connectivity. That's one of the aspects. The other is providing services that are perhaps catered to them even so that they can leverage our network in a fashion that makes more sense for them. The closer they get their content to our customer, the better off we both are. The, uh, the more low latency services we can provide in, in different situations, in other words, this bandwidth scheduling or bandwidth on demand, the better off they are. They've got hotspots that they want to address. We would much rather rearrange the network to support that as opposed to using our resources for free, if in many cases, to deliver that content when it's targeted at a particular area or coming from a particular source. Let's work together to solve those. And I think it's an optimization. It goes even beyond our network optimization, which is tough enough the way it is. <laughs> now it's optimization between uh, potential users, customers, and the network in order to provide the, the lowest latency, lowest cost, fewest hops, to get the two connected together, and that's something that I, I think we haven't done in the past. We've started to do it, and now we're getting the tools to try and uh, optimize that, that uh, multi-service design, if you want. So working with them as opposed to against them. Working with them as opposed to against them. I mean, we have our own over-the-top type services, and we'll yep. leverage those, and we'll continue to grow that business, but we know that we're not going to always be the, the, the only over-the-top provider. They're <laughs> going to be there. It's a reality of the world we're living in. What we'd like to do is work with them to build optimal services that uh, get them the, the best performance and us the lowest cost. Well, that's very interesting. I appreciate your time today. I look forward to talking to you. And Thank you very much.